and welcome to the second meeting of the Hutchinson's Hospital Transfer and Dissolution Scotland Bill Committee. Can I remind those members that are present and, uh, that mobile phones should be set to silent. Um, we're missing Ruth Maguire at the moment, one of the members of the committee. That's because she is currently moving amendments at local government committee. So depending on how long that takes, she may pop in or, or she may not be here today. But just for the record, that's why uh, she's not currently with us. I should also say to you that when you're speaking, uh, the gentleman to your left will control your microphones. You don't have to worry about any of the buttons in front of you. So the first uh, item on our agenda is a decision on taking business in private. And the first thing we need to do is to decide whether to take item three in private. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the second decision is whether to consider evidence at future meetings in private. Can I ask you to agree that? Agreed. Agreed. And the third decision is whether to consider key issues for the preliminary stage report in private at future meetings. As Agreed. Well. Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, so today we are taking evidence from the promoters of the bill, the patrons of the Royal Incorporation of Hutchinson's Hospital in the city of Glasgow. And I get to now formally welcome David Dobson, a member of the executive committee at Hutchinson's Hospital Charity, Donald Reid from Mitchell's Robertin Limited, the Chamberlains to the Hutchinson's Hospital Charity, and Charles Livingston and L Alan Eccles uh, from Brodie's LLP, who are the legal advisors to the Hutchinson's Hospital Charity. What we're going to do is uh, open up to some questions uh, over the next wee while, but before we do that, could I just uh, ask you to tell the committee a little bit about what you do in relation to this bill, just a little more background, and perhaps start with yourself, Alan. Um, good, good morning, Kavina. Um, Alan Eccles, I a partner in the charities team at uh, Brodie's and uh, Charles and myself have been uh, advising the uh, charity uh, on this process and from my perspective in particularly around the Oscar processes in getting the new charity set up which um, uh, would be the recipient body for the assets currently held by the charity in its current format. Thank you, David. Um. I was appointed as patron of Hutchison's Hospital in 2015 by the Trades House of Glasgow. Uh, since January 2017, I have been a member of the executive, executive committee of the hospital. Good morning, convener and members. My name is Donald Reid. I'm the chairman of Mitchell's Robertson Limited, who are <coughs> enjoy the fancy title of Chamberlains to the Hutchison's Hospital. Mitchells Robertson have acted in this capacity for at least 200 years. Despite appearances, I was not present at the inception of our instructions. Um, <clears throat> I've personally been involved acting for the hospital since 1989. Uh, over the years that I've been involved, the uh, demands of governance and, uh, governance and administration have steadily increased and have by now become unwieldy, which is why uh, I am pleased to be involved in seeking the uh, streamlining which, among other things, this bill will hopefully produce. And Donald, you said uh, 200 years there, but the bill that we're dealing with is 1872. That's right. Uh, if you read all the boring stuff that uh, uh, goes with the copy of the 1872 Act, you'll see that it had been in existence prior to the coming into force of the 1872 Act under earlier uh, a documentation including our Royal Charter of 1821. Thank you. Uh, and I'm Charles Livingston, also a partner in uh, Brodie's, but I am in the Government Regulation and Competition team. Um, so with Alan advised the charity on the private bill process. My role in particular was um, actually drafting the bill. Um, I've drafted a few private uh, and indeed members' bills, um, and uh, also dealing with the, the consultation and notification exercises. Lovely, thank you. So David, if I could maybe start with you, um, could you explain to the committee why the patrons of the incorporation uh, concluded that a change is needed? Why are we here? Uh, to allow the patrons to become more agile uh, in decision making and in uh, governance with regard to the trust. At the moment there are, I believe, 95 people who are patrons of the trust and if we see 15 of them we're very very lucky uh, however the 95 people have to be contacted properly and are done that is done 
So there is a burden of that, and there's also a burden, burden of checking uh, that they have been informed of the meetings and so on. Also, various people are appointed patrons ex officio of other posts. Hence, the uh, deacon convener of the Trades House of Glasgow, ex officio, is a patron of Hutchison's Hospital. He will be a patron for the year that he's in uh, post as deacon convener. And in about that, that year, that gives you about enough time to find where the paper clips are, uh, and not very much time to do anything effective. It's another change that will be incorporated in this. We will not be naming posts. We will be naming nominating bodies, like the Merchant House of Glasgow, as a body nominating people to serve as patrons. Uh, we hope this will ensure that the people who become patrons aren't being forced to become patrons, but are being willingly involved in our organisation and therefore be more active to our benefit. That's really helpful, thank you. I guess the automatic question that flows on from that is, why now? I guess those arguments could have been made five years ago or ten years ago. What, what's the impetus to do this now? And that's really open to anyone on the, on the panel. Donald? The, the impetus is, is partly <coughs> financial in that the <coughs> commitment uh, of time and effort to managing the extensive paperwork that is just simply generated by the sheer number of people means that that cost, although it's a management cost rather than a direct cost that you can put your finger on, that uh, that cost uh, <coughs> has become, uh, in recent years, with cost awareness uh, coming to the fore, as it does in all organisations, has become one that we need to look at where we can. And uh, <coughs> the other reason is, uh, uh, apart, apart from the cost, is uh, that it's simply been borne in upon the patrons and the trustees, probably following the 2005 Act, that the need to modernise and streamline the operation of a charity like ours, which is not enormous, but at the same time is not negligible in terms of its funds, uh, has become acute. And uh, we are simply responding to what we perceive to be the expectation of best practice in the charity sector. Thank you. Just got a brief follow-up from Stuart Stevenson on that. Um, I just want to challenge what, what I'm hearing a little bit to make sure we get a proper understanding. Um, if we were dealing with uh, a company registered under the Companies Act, we would expect that company to communicate with all its shareholders. So that's a model that I see here. Similarly, if it was uh, uh, a charity under Oscar, etc., uh, again, it is a matter of regular behaviour that uh, charities would be communicating quite actively with the people who've joined as members. I mean, looking at the 1872 uh, Act, you know, I'm just picking at random, more or less, and whereas it is expedient the patrons should be empowered as they fit, etc. In other words, it's directly saying these pat patrons, relatively large number, have been explained to the committee, uh, are under the present arrangements directly involved or able to be. And I just wonder, are you not in danger of losing something important as a charity by, if you like, and I, I just use this term to provoke you to answer, um, by casting off this cadre of important people in your community who are supporting what uh, Hutchison's uh, are trying to do? Understand it. If I could, if I initially answer that, there may be other answers. Uh, we are not casting off anybody. They have voted with their feet by not attending our AGMs and basically ex attending to their duties, if we wanted to be over the top about it. Uh, and the model that we are trying to affect is the model that has arrived over the last several years. So we are just making the law catch up with the practice. So I don't think we'll lose anything. There's an active uh, group of uh, patrons currently who are often in the executive committee. This will be reflected in the 
an equally active group of patrons that will be established in the scale, which of course will be subject to the Oscar scrutiny that you mentioned. Let's come back on that very briefly because we want to move on, obviously. Um, if such a large proportion of the, uh, the patrons as they currently exist have essentially become disconnected from the work of the charity, is this not equally an indication that perhaps the time is uh, up for the charity and uh, arrangements other than perpetuating it should, should be being considered? Uh, <coughs> no. Uh, it's a short answer. Um, the charity's work, particularly its work with a, the needy elderly people that it supports, is by no means out of date or moribund. Uh, on the contrary, the people that are supported by the charity are very grateful and uh, the flood of gr uh, letters of gratitude that come in regularly are a a great encouragement, shall we say, to the patrons to realise that they're actually doing work which is greatly appreciated by people who benefit. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to say is that um, there has always, like any body which comprises a large number of people, there are drivers uh, <clears throat> and there are passengers. Um, and we, that's the case here. The passengers, we, if I can use that term, I don't really use it pejoratively eh, because it's inevitable in a big group that there will be some who are less involved in the running of it than others. The passengers, if we can put it that way, are very heavily committed individuals in their own fields from which ex officio without their own choice really and without even their knowledge until they finally arrive there, <clears throat> have been appointed. They can't all be expected to be as involved as the few who choose to make Hutchison's Hospital one of their special interests. And it's been to the great benefit of the hospital that a, a number of these individuals who are ex officio have chosen to do it that way. And a, <clears throat> a, in particular, say, councillors of the city of Glasgow, there's always been a few of them who have taken the hospital very seriously and quite a number of our recent preceptors in the past 30 years have been councillors of the city of Glasgow. There's always a few, but a, this, is, this, suggest, this whole idea has been driven as much by the council a, as by the, a, the administration of Hutchison's Hospital because they can see this, uh, this a, an unwieldy nature of all the councillors being trustees and not all of them, in fact, only a few of them being able to be as focused upon the hospital as we would ideally like. So for these reasons, the answer to your question is no. Uh, thank you. That's helpful to get that all on the record, I think. Convener. Thank you. Just moving on, can you tell us a little bit more about the constraints that the 1872 Act places on you and what you can't do as a consequence of that, for example, and what you might be able to do that you can't do when you become a Scottish charity uh, incorporated organisation? Less. Uh, uh, there's less in that. Uh, the ability to uh, do what is required by the 1872 Act is being done. It's the administration side and the cumbersome nature of the administration that is the real problem, rather than that there is anything which needs to be done which is not being properly done at the moment. Um, <clears throat> if we had a skill, uh, it would certainly afford, to use uh, Mr Dobson's word, greater agility. That's to say, if something came up in the future which needed a, in conventional terms, an adjustment of the purposes or the constitution of the charity, it will be easier under the banner of Oscar to adjust to meet needs as they develop. But we're not a, there is no, a, we, our hands are not tied behind our back at the moment. It's just that moving is, a, it's like being in a spacesuit. A, a, rather than a, in, in a athletic gear to be able to get done what get, needs to be done. But it gets done. That's helpful. I mean, do, do you have any intentions of fundamentally changing the nature of the organisation going forward? Are you saying that this is basically about a uh, tidying up exercise? You know? well, it's a tidying up exercise. That, I think, uh, states it uh, too uh, 
minimally. It's more than that. It's a, 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 I think governance is more than simply being tidy about the way you go about things. It's about a, improving the link between the trustees and their responsibilities so that the trustees are all more positively involved in the running of the charity and the decisions that it has to make rather than simply we are, we are trying to tidy something up. Well, Charles? Yeah, um, I think we could say as well that uh, there is a, a great uh, degree of connection between the purposes of the scheme in terms of its constitution um, and what the 1872 Act requires. So they're, they're expressed in more modern terms. Sorry, uh, Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation. Um, so the, the constitution, and probably Alan is best placed to talk about this, but the constitution of that does um, mirror, not, not identically, but in, in its essence, um, the current uh, purposes and activities of the charity. And I think it's also fair to say that um, the, nature of a the current nature of the charity as a, a corporation established by statute doesn't really lend itself to um, modern financial management of the sort that the hospital um, would ideally do in terms of managing its investments and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I would defer to Alan on the details okay, I was going to say a, a wee bit more about that, because that, uh, that was wonderful lawyer speak. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that in terms of managing financial resources? Um, Is that about borrowing? Is it loans? Is it... I'll actually well, defer to Alan on that on skills as a vehicle. It, it, a skill um, provides charities with a, a modern structure. came in in 2011. They're now far and away the most popular format for new charities. Um, and they give charities and their trustees all the powers that they need to carry out their purposes. Um, other structures, trusts, um, uh, organisations like the hospital that are set up uh, under uh, an Act of Parliament, there are certain restrictions in there that uh, make it, in some cases, um, that they don't have the same flexibilities to carry out their purposes. So it's creating flexibility that other modern charities are able to take advantage of. But also, very importantly, this is really about getting the governance right, streamlined, getting the best out of those organisations that have, um, over the years, offered up uh, the trustees here, um, but without changing the purposes, really. They are slightly modernised, but without being changed. I understand that, but I asked very specifically about finances. So is there it, a specific element of what will change around it, the financial structure? It, 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 it gives wider investment powers and more flexible investment powers. Um, a skill has the power to do anything it so chooses, so long as that furthers the purposes of the charity, whereas as currently constituted, um, there are you do not get the complete width of, in, of investment powers, for example, and that has been the case and really until the SCIO, um and the 2005 Act, a lot of charitable structures have had restrictions on how they could best invest and in a way that uh, would actually put, in some cases, charities at a disadvantage in terms of uh, generating a return for their purposes. I'm just going to push you a little bit further mm. on that because the, the whole point of this process is to clearly evidence to Parliament why, why this is necessary. So I think it would be really helpful if we could understand you know, very specifically what it is you could do after this happens that you can't, currently can't do in the context of investment. Uh, well, you, you, you could invest in, in anything that furthers the charity's purposes. So any, any, if an investment manager thought it was... Um, a good idea to be investing in a particular way, then so long as the trustees think that is right for the charity, you can do that. You do not get the same flexibility and there are more restrictions on what you could do and invest in um, in its current format. The That's other what side I was of it, looking for. Thank and you. the other side of it is the changing the composition of the trustees, which is perhaps really the most important bit of it. Okay, a uh, follow up on that from Morris. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Alan, on, on that question of investment, are you saying, therefore, that you will get, be able to get, bluntly, a better state a re return on investment under the, under the proposals that you're c considering? Is that going to increase the that bottom line, basically, which is therefore given out to the good causes? If there was um, investment advice um, that suggested investing a particular way and that was right for the charity, they could take that up now uh, as a skill, whereas... Um, incorporated by an Act of Parliament, there are some restrictions there. So, yes, it has the potential to create a better return for the charity. Um, but as I say, perhaps the main driver is the 
is the is the quite unwieldy and cumbersome trustee group uh, that, that there is uh, at the moment, which is the a really key driver to the to the real governance benefit that the the skill would give over the Act to Parliament. Can I just tell that? That's fine. That's, that's okay. Um, but are we therefore looking at maybe some changes where there might be restrictions or, or opening to what we call green policies? You know, the situation the Church of England has had recently on its investments. Is there any link to that sort of idea, or is this going to avoid that? Or uh, no, uh, I, in many ways, quite the opposite. Um, I quite often think of how charities invest as being purposes led. So if you're entering into a the scale regime where your powers are based on what is best for your purposes and connected to your purposes and further your purposes, then actually um, it ensures that you are taking those proper ethical social considerations into account to make sure that that ties in with your purposes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And another uh, follow-up from Stuart. Okay. Um, I'm just reading the 1872 Act oh. and um, Section 4 in particular says uh, patrons shall have the power to apply the remainder of evidence and a part not exceeding one third of the capital of the hospital, etc. Is that an example of the constraints that come from the 1872 Act? You know, the one third of the capital. And, and I only choose that just as one example of what will be relieved if you move to the scale environment. Yes, and, and certainly the scale in terms of its purposes um, whilst respecting what has been there in the past, do things in a much more permissive uh, way um, to enable the trustees to do things rather than putting limits uh, on what they are doing. That's fine. Okay. That's really helpful. Sorry for the interrogation, but you'll understand that this is all about helping aid the process, and that's what we're here to do. Could I just go back to David and Donald and ask you a little bit more about the, the current activities of the organisation? Tell us a bit more about what it is you actually do for the purposes of the record. We, <coughs> we currently uh, give grants or pensions to a group of um, needy people in Glasgow a group of 20 to 30 currently. Uh, these people also get uh, the benefit of a social worker who we employ on a part-time basis who visits all, our, uh, all of our grantees and makes sure everything is going well with them. So that is one main thrust of uh, the objection, of the, the purposes of the trust. That, of course, is going to be maintained absolutely. Currently, the other uh, broad description of the uh, purpose of the trust is the advancement of education in Glasgow. Over the years, that has become uh, established as being the paying of 40% of the net income of the trust to another charity, namely Hutchison's Educational Trust. We have no intention of changing that and that will be within the uh, authority granted by the new scale should we start operating that way. But it will also free up that uh, other things in the education field could be part of the uh, uh, remit of the trust. The Act talks about schools and in fact uh, predicts the arrival of what became known as Hutchison's Girls Grammar School prior to the, the Act. It was only boys that were educated. Uh, but these things, um, it will be a wee bit more than tidying up the statute book by removing from us the power to run schools, which we have at the moment, but don't wish to use and in any future any of us can envisage will not be a future for Hutchison's Hospital. You've been quite clear there that you don't see any of the current activities materially changing um, going forward. But push you a bit further on that. Is there any sense that anybody currently in receipt of the benefits of your organisation would lose out as a consequence of this change? None whatsoever. Uh, and indeed, all of the grantees have been communicated with uh, to explain the situation that we are, are trying to advance. Uh, I think that's recorded in the information that's been passed to the committee. Yeah. And I just mention that as 
to clarify that there's no thought of there being any change. And one final question for me before I pass to Stuart. Just around the issue of um, what you're essentially doing is, is streamlining and make it much more um, easier to manage this organisation going forward. I guess we'd like to hear a little bit more about how you plan to manage it appropriately when there's uh, such a material change in, in how it's operated. Who will do that? Um, me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So it's moment. about freeing up your time, Donald. So you're a bit less paperwork, a bit more focus uh, on yes, the objective. Yes, and a bit less, a bit less fees to me, uh, convener. I'm afraid. Fees. I'm going to get paid less. <laughs> this um, is the first time somebody's come to the Scottish Parliament and argued for less money. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit more about that. Well, uh, at, at the moment, the way the the hospital charity operates is with this enormous group of trustees, uh, who. Ha every year empower an executive committee of a smaller number, approximately seven or eight, actually to run the show. Uh, and to uh, <coughs> that committee meets quarterly and makes decisions about the investments. It hears reports on the various beneficiaries who are receiving grants. It hears reports from the Educational Trust uh, <coughs> on how the funds that are directed there are being deployed in its bursary fund in order to benefit uh, students at the school who would not otherwise be able to be at the school. Um, it, he's, here's these reports. And uh, <coughs> in, for example, in the case of the beneficiaries, there's a lot of quite important personal information which is, has to be made available in order that these reports can be meaningful. So there's got to be a very careful management of the personal data, all of which is a managed in accordance with the Data Protection Act and all and GDPR and all that. Um, and a, a, that's a, a, the reason that thing, a, going forward from there, we'll have a group of trustees who will be committed and informed to the same extent as the um, executive committee members currently are, uh, but uh, we will be hoping, you see, that by them being appointed by choice rather than simply imp having it imposed on them as a result of a different office they hold, that the overall body of commitment and understanding will be broader and that there will be a greater a ability th thereafter to look at innovations if innovations should come along that might be suggested. At the moment, because of the sheer size of the number of trustees that are out there, it's more just a case of ticking over and doing what needs to be done uh, because uh, involving uh, getting major decisions considered by a much larger body is a much more difficult thing. Thank you for that. Stuart. Sorry, Maurice, did you, yes. you, you talk, uh, Donald, about the um, enormous number of trustees. How, how many are we talking about? 95. Well, why did that happen? It's in the Act. Right, OK. It's, Sorry, enough. Um, it's ex, it's ex officio appointments, so every um, elected member of Glasgow City Council is an ex officio right, trustee okay. right. of the hospital, um, which is why it was mentioned earlier that um, this part of the driver for this is actually um, on the council's part a desire to to rationalise um, the the various offices to which councillors are are automatically appointed, as Donald said, whether they even know about it or not. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've had a, a fair bit talked about capital, for example, about why we need to move to a different legal basis uh, away from the legislation. Is there anything that hasn't come up in the questions we've asked so far that adds to? Uh, why we need to legislate? The answer might be no. <laughs> right, the answer is no. That's fine. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm quite content with that as far as it goes. Um, now, the, the the alternatives that uh, uh, you, your promoter's memorandum talks about, Section 42 of the uh, uh, Charities and Trustee Investments Compact Act 2005. Um, and I've, I've had a look at that, and I, I, I can see uh, some of the issues there. But there's also Section 39 of the Act, um, which I've, I've got in front of me, which uh, certainly appears to provide an alternative 
uh, way of having or reorganizations. And uh, although uh, there are some complexities associated with the way it's expressed, it's clearly an alternative way that you could have proceeded. To what extent was that considered and why might, why, if it was considered, did you dismiss it? Um, so that, uh, that's not an option for a charity that's incorporated by Act of Parliament um, because the, the charity doesn't have the ability to, um, to reorganise its own constitution. Um, so, uh, for, for an Act of Parliament, um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a separate... Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have the entirety of the 2005 can Act. I, can I just take you to Section 42 mm -hmm. uh, of the 2005 Act? Um, it, 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 it specifically says, um, under Subsection 3, a reorganisation scheme is a scheme where a variation of the constitution of the charity, da-da-da-da, transfer of property, amalgamation with another charity. Um, but it then goes on, um, and, and subsection five, um, does not apply, uh, constituted under royal charter or warrant or under any enactment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're hanging your hat on. But it then goes on in section, subsection six to say, but despite subsection five, which is the enactment provision, these sections do apply to an endowment if its governing body is a charity. Now, I am not a lawyer, but it, it would appear reading that that you would be caught by subsection 6 because, albeit you are by enactment established, you nonetheless would appear to have the power if it's, as your governing body is de facto, if not under current legislation, a charity, and therefore would be able to reorganise by that means. So I'd just be interested... To, to, to hear your observations on that yep. without without getting to the point where I, as a lay person, become so baffled that I dissolve. Um, I will do my best. Um, so, uh, yes, the, the answer is section... The answer in respect to section 39 is section 42.5, which disapplies section 39 and 40 to any charity constituted under an enactment. There is an exception um, for... Uh, an endowment if its governing body is a charity. Um, now, the difficulty with section uh, 42 and that drafting is that that drafting um, reflects the way in which educational endowments are spoken about. So we mentioned the Hutchison's Educational Trust, for example. Um, that's an example of where a scheme was made under, and there have been four or five different pieces of educational legislation um, where uh, endowments could be uh, placed into the hands of a governing body and that legislation um, creates a clear distinction between the concept of an endowment and the concept of a governing body. Um, that distinction uh, does not exist in relation to the hospital because it's not really possible to identify uh, one thing that is an endowment and one thing that is a governing body. Um, so it's, it's probably impossible to um, explain it without getting very technical. Um, but um, I can certainly say that Oscar um, grapples with this issue itself. So in response to our consultation letter, um, Oscar's response, and, and it's noted, uh, the, the summary of it is noted in the promoter's memorandum, but I can possibly read it out um, for the record. Um, so uh, Oscar, in reply to our consultation letter, said, I note that we were previously asked to consider what options were open to the charity trustees of the incorporation to achieve the modernisation they intend, and in particular whether the reorganisation provisions of the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005 would be available to them. Our view was that in order for the incorporation of Hutchinson's Hospital to, to be able to rely on the reorganisation provisions, it must establish that the charity holds property that qualifies as an endowment. The drafting of Section 42 of the 2005 Act on this point is ambiguous and its interpretation is difficult. Indeed, we have recommended to ministers that it should be amended. It is therefore understandable that the charity trustees have chosen to promote a private bill and we have no particular comment on and certainly no objection in principle to the proposal. Um, so the, the position is not necessarily that we can say with certainty uh, that we fall outside um, or indeed inside section 42.6. The difficulty is that this is never, its interpretation has never been tested in court. So anybody that relied on 42.6 would be, that reorganisation would be vulnerable to a challenge. 
um, and we as advisors are not able to say to a charity in the position um, of the hospital um, that you can definitely rely on that. And while the prospects of that being challenged and struck down are, are possibly quite low, the impact of such a result would be it would be almost impossible to deal with. Um, so uh, that's why um, section uh, the reorganisation provisions for bodies established under an Act of Parliament, with the probable exception of the educational endowments that I mentioned, who do fit more neatly within the legislation, um, we have not been in a position to advise any such charities that they can use the reorganisation provisions with absolute confidence. Um, I, I find that relatively compelling. Um, however, just looking at the 1872 Act, it, in essence, the source of uh, funding is from mortifications, which are a particular form of uh, testamentary provision, I understand it. Uh, do they constitute endowments to the charity in legal terms? The, the property may constitute an endowment, but the, the difficulty, there is an additional difficulty in unpicking section 42.6, which says that the sections apply to the endowment if its governing body is a charity. If we are dealing with an endowment here, then the, endow the endowment is the collection of property and assets. Um, the Act doesn't say that the reorganisation provisions can be applied to the governing body. It says right. it can be applied to the endowment. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's um, in Oscar's words, ambiguous and difficult to interpret. Well, I, th I, I think I'm going to rely on what Oscar is saying, <laughs> which is, is, seems a, a perfectly proper place to to, to go and, and, and equally the uncertainty of that option compared perhaps to the one that you're now, now pursuing. So I think, I think that's, uh, uh, that's helpful. Um, just a couple of things about the, the patrons, which I think we can probably deal with fairly briefly. Um, we've heard that there's only a small proportion of the patrons uh, who actively involve themselves in uh, the uh, Hutchison's Hospital. Uh, in this particular case, of course, it's a more fundamental issue. Uh, are you surprised that in this case uh, uh, th there's such a small number have got involved in this fundamental reorganisation? Oh, um, well, well, I'll answer that one if I may, Mr Stevenson. Um, we're no more surprised about the commitment of the... Uh, <coughs> totality of the trustees to this issue than the generally the commitment over the years. That's to say there has always been a few who are committed and the vast majority who, for the reasons I've sought to explain earlier, do not a, participate to any degree. Um, the, uh, the democracy of the decision to proceed to seek to promote this bill was fully observed in the uh, holding of the relevant meetings and giving notice and so on, and none, none of the trustees had any issues to raise with the wisdom of it and were no doubt being guided by the fact that they knew there was an executive committee on whom they had good reason to be able to rely. Uh, just, to, I'm going to be extremely picky. Are you using the word trustees as a surrogate and equivalent to patrons? I am, yes. Right, that's fine. Just to be clear that we're not talking about something different. Um, and, and did any of the people who did not attend the meeting otherwise provide any feedback? I think I'm right to say none did. That's fine. We'll move on. Okay, thank you. Morris? Thank you, Chair. Um, sort of following on from <coughs> uh, Stuart Stevenson's uh, comments, um, you, you, you talk about, obviously I've asked the question about the 95 figure of people who have been involved under the original, under the original, the current situation. How many organisations and people did you actually write to in relation to the consultation? Was it more than that? Um, so the, and if uh, so, who were they? The uh, consultation letters, um, well the consultation uh, took place in, in two phases really, so there was there was discussion with the various bodies who are involved in um, either appointing uh, patrons to the charity or uh, whose members are uh, ex officio um, patrons. Um, so there were, there were discussions with um, Glasgow City Council, Merchants House of Glasgow, Trades House of Glasgow and the Presbytery of Glasgow. 
Um, and there are, the reason for the presbytery is there are um, <coughs> ministers of various parishes who, like councillors, are appointed ex officio, whether they want to be or know about it or not. Um, and there were also discussions with Hutchison's Educational Trust as a significant beneficiary of the charity. Um, so those were uh, those took place in the um, the phase of, of developing the proposals and ensuring that people were were on board with those. Then um, at the formal stage, so in terms of the pre-introduction consultation, um, letters were sent to uh, the governors of Hutchison's Educational Trust. Um, as Donald mentioned, or as I think David mentioned, uh, everybody currently in receipt of a pension granted by the incorporation, they received a letter to advise them um, of what the proposal was. Um, we also wrote to Glasgow City Council, uh, Merchants House, Trades House, Glasgow Presbytery and the Archdiocese of Glasgow um, because all of these uh, bodies will be uh, either already have people um, appointed to the existing trustee body or under the SKEO constitution have the ability but not the obligation to appoint um, trustees to the SKEO um, and we also wrote to Oscar. D do you feel that um, you've got a pretty poor response? Um, well, we got responses from uh, Glasgow City Council, um, w which was uh, supportive for the reason I mentioned their interest in rationalising the obligations on their members. Um, we got a response from uh, the Trades House, which was supportive, um, and we got the response from Oscar that I've already read out in part. Um, there had already been discussions with uh, the Educational Trust, so we weren't necessarily expecting a response to that formal uh, letter. Um, we we're not expecting responses from anybody in receipt of a pension. Um, the reason that that letter was sent out while, while inviting their views was principally to give them comfort that, as discussed earlier, they should not expect anything to change. Um, and uh, Merchant's House uh, had been uh, closely involved uh, with the discussions as well. And indeed, I, I think it's fair to say that the Merchant's House and Trades House patrons are among the more active um, on the charity. Um, so we were we were not necessarily expecting uh, more replies than we received to those letters. Um, Donald, do you want to say something about the earlier engagement? Uh, well, yes, I was just going to add if you uh, that uh, uh, personally I'd had prior discussions with the Glasgow Presbytery in, uh, among other things, making sure that I was up to date with all the various amalgamations of churches that have taken place over the past 150 years within the Glasgow Presbytery area to be sure that we were indeed addressing as a patron the correct minister, who in most cases is now the minister of several amalgamated parishes, as distinct from the way it was before. So the Glasgow Presbytery, and then in the context of that, uh, there were a discussions, or at least a, the Glasgow Presbytery, the, the office with which I was communicating, was advised of this proposal that we move forward on that basis and it indicated at that point, simply informally, that a, they would approve it and would a, endeavour to participate in appointing relevant patrons or trustees come the day if it happened. Therefore, speaking a, from that experience, I'm not surprised that the presbytery did not offer any formal response to the intimation when it was made because it probably felt it already had done. One other thing just to say is it wasn't a poor response. It was a good response. Um, if a proposal is meets with favour uh, and receives no objections, that is actually a good response. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking for the sheer numbers. I mean, I mean, what attempt was made by the committee, etc., to follow up those who did not reply? Now, you've talked about, Mr. Reid, about you know, talking to the presbytery at length and obviously understanding from that. Was there any actual attempt made to follow up those and say, look, we're sorry you haven't replied. Is there any, have you had any further objection before we finally close that? No. no. Why not? Um, because uh, we had, we had uh, engaged with um, the key bodies from whom we would expect engagement based on the experience of the incorporation uh, as to who was and was not engaged. Yeah. Um, I, I should add, although these were not um, consultation letters because they went out to uh, trustees rather than external bodies, um, there were also letters that went out to um, everybody who was a trustee of the incorporation 
um, as, as an update, basically reminding them of what had been agreed at the previous uh, annual meeting to pursue the private bill um, and telling them that we had reached the stage where we were going to be introducing the bill, and this was pre-introduction as well. So you categorically feel that there's been no objections at all, not even a smidgen of a sniff of it? Categorically. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a few wrap-up questions and then offer you the opportunity to tell us anything else you don't think that we've covered. But can I take you back to 1821, which is where I think we started here? Looking at the explanatory notes of the bill, it says the charity was initially built up in the 17th century by way of multiple deeds of mortification and similar deeds, some of which are written in Old Scots or otherwise archaic language. And in particular, the possibility that there may still be valid documents of which the current patrons are unaware. I guess I'd like to know what you think the chances are of uh, old documents turning up that might scupper your efforts. I can speak to that as probably the, the person of, of the three lawyers, lawyers before you. I'm undoubtedly the oldest. Uh, <coughs> And in my, in, in my personal uh, experience of 30 years, in fact, more than 30 years, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I've got black over the years uh, going through tin boxes full of stuff, looking for anything that might be relevant, not finding it. And this stuff uh, is the archives of the, my firm, which, as I've said, well, actually, for a wee boast, it's the oldest firm in Glasgow. And it's, some of his archives go way, go way back deep into the 19th century, and, and one or two interesting documents I found dating from the 18th century and even earlier. There's nothing there. So uh, we, I, I would think that uh, it's so, such a remote possibility as to be discounted to nil. So there's no chance of finding a document which might challenge the kind of objectives of the organisation going forward? So I, I don't I, think so. I can maybe convener. Sorry, I, I can maybe just add to that from a legal perspective. So the, the reason that is mentioned in the explanatory notes is to explain uh, why the legislation itself takes what is very much a, a belt and braces, ultra cautious uh, approach to capturing everything that might have a connection with the incorporation and that one would want to go across um, to the scale. Um, so, in fact, the background, uh, 1821, is the Royal Charter, the, the various deeds of mortification and other um, legacies, um, they date back as early as 1639. Um, so, it is, we cannot envisage of what might come about. It is extremely unlikely that anything might come about. Um, but what we didn't want was for this legislation to leave any prospect of there being a, a, a legal or ownership lacuna in respect of any property or obligation or anything like that. Um, so that explanation is there to explain why the legislation is a little bit more extensive, it has more subsections to it than some other examples of uh, charities that have been constituted under Act of Parliament and are looking to reconstitute in another form. Um, it's because we're, we're dealing with things that are so historic and have come from so many sources um, that we, we just didn't want to leave even the possibility of something being left behind. So in the event that something does appear, the legislation will have taken care of that and the SCIO will be the responsible body to deal with it. So it won't undermine anything that the Act is doing. Um, the Act is intended to protect against that eventuality. So what you're bill, saying sorry. is, in the scope of the drafting, you've done it in such a way to scoop up anything that might arrive and provide any mechanism to deal with it in that event? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's to leave nothing behind was the approach. Thank you. And just a, a follow-up from Stuart. Um, I'm just going back to the 1872 Act and uh, Section 26 thereof, um, which looks very much like a sort of standard legal catch-all. Um, and I'd I would just invite you to agree that uh, the intention uh, of 26 is basically to catch everything that went before, you know, just reading bits of it. All property heritable movable, real and personal, wherever situated at the time of passing that, and all conveyances, assignments, and then a long list of other things, da-da-da-da, uh, oh yes, now we're going a behoof or connected with the hospital, before mentioned modification charities, whether the same are held absolutely in security. And it, it really is the most comprehensive of legal lists that in 1872 would scoop up everything, whether known about at that time or thereafter or not, and that, that, that 
that could be something upon which we rely on to catch all the things which are unknown. Yes. Is that a, that's, would be the intention of that bit of drafting? Yes, so if, if this bill were not passed um, and something uh, cropped up from pre-1872, you would be looking to rely on Section 26 yeah. um, to, to confirm that that was held in the, in the incorporation as it's currently constituted. Um, what the current bill um, intends to do is to, uh, using more modern dra and hopefully more understandable drafting, um, looks to apply a similar approach now. Um, so not only will we avoid uh, any issues in respect of things pre-1872, we'll avoid any uh, issue in respect of anything done between 1872 and the point at which this bill is passed, if, if indeed it is. Uh, and, and indeed, the bill that's before us that you brought to us does not abolish the 1872 Act. Um, it, does it? it? Yes, it does. It does repeal. I've, I've just very quickly looked at it without, and I've left my glasses somewhere else. <clears throat> oh, it is a dissolution. Ah, oh, well, yes, it might say that. But does it do yes, it? it's uh, it's section two one, um, which says uh, that the uh, oh yes, the, the transfer, transfer or is, is dissolved. Uh, oh, um, no, it, and it's then, section and then, two. And Correct. two says it's the act Because it's the top of the page, yeah. I didn't see it. My apologies. Thank you. Um, that's been pretty comprehensive. Is there anything that you would like to get on the record that we haven't given you the opportunity to say or do? On behalf of the hospital, uh, or my role in it, to thank this committee for its careful addressing of these issues and for the opportunity to respond to your questions. Great. Well, well thank you very much for your evidence this morning. We, we wish you well. That is the um, public part of the committee business concluded for the day. So I'm just going to uh, suspend in a second. But before I do that, can I just advise that the committee will next meet on Wednesday, the 28th of November. Thank you very much. That's it suspended. <laughs>